we're in open nine. Open nine. Okay, thank you uh, for that, Stella. Um, we're now on open session. Uh, welcome members and anyone listening to the uh, weekly meeting of the ERA committee. We're broadcast online. Um, as we um, uh, answer a part of the buildings, um, you, we know the, the rules. The members can use the mobile devices as long as they're in airplane mode and muted. Um, okay. Um, Members, just just remind back there from uh, from earlier in the meeting that make sure the microphones are muted until we need to speak, uh, because the background noises can be heard um, and it disrupts the sound. And if you want to speak, uh, let me know by the mobile the, the WhatsApp facility. Um, I want to advise members that today's meeting will include an oral uh, evidence from the RSPB on the risk to the natural environment by the introduction of SRs, which will. Um, reduce the inspection rates. There's two SRs on direct payment to farmers, an SL1 and three uh, written briefings. I want to advise members that the oral briefing on the climate change bill discussion document will not now happen as the papers were not cleared in time for the table to pack. The TARC uh, is attempting to reschedule this briefing for next week, the 25th of February, but it will re require us having a 9 a.m. start. Uh, matters are rising. Uh, Members, following on from our discussion uh, in the closed session uh, earlier, uh, can I refer members to the terms of reference and action plan for the committee investigation into the porch? Can I seek uh, agreement for the terms of reference? Great. Um, okay, thank you. Um, the committee uh, team will now action uh, the action plan as previously agreed by the committee. I want to refer to the wording for John Blair's proposed motion on nature-friendly farming. I seek agreement for the actions in relation to oral uh, and written evidence, a uh, research paper and timescale as outlined in the action plan. Great. I want to refer members to the committee budget report. And can I seek agreement to forward this to the Finance Committee? I will then speak as chairperson on the debate and will cover many of the issues we have raised in this report. Okay. Uh, item number two in the agenda is uh, apologies. We don't have any apologies today. Uh, full attendance. Thank you. Um, and I want to advise members that I will be uh, attending a, a private informal meeting in my capacity as chairperson, along with other chairs and committees, with an interest in Brexit um, scrutiny with the NI Affairs Committee on the 2nd of March. Um, item number four. Uh, the draft minutes. I want to refer members to the draft minutes um, the, from the meeting of the 11th of February at page 24. Our members, can I get agreement for the, uh, the, the minutes? All nods, yeah. Uh, can I formally uh, state for the record that Rosemary did ask that her vote on the work by the committee on staffing at Porch be recorded? Um, as against rather than as abstention. The request happened in closed session, and I'm setting now what happened for the public record. I, want, I also note that I will uh, physically sign the minutes at the next available opportunity. Um, item number five uh, on the agenda is an uh, oral evidence session, an update on the climate change bill, a discussion document on, on policy proposals for the draft bill, I want to advise members that the briefing paper from the department did not arrive in the committee office in time for a meeting pack for the meeting pack. Staff has since been advised that there that it has been delayed and it will not be available for today's meeting. Therefore, the committee had no alternative but to defer consideration of this uh, agenda item. The clerk is attempting to reschedule this uh, item for the 25th of February. And I should note that the committee uh, has already written to the permanent secretary on this issue before and asked them to urgently address the situation. Uh, can I seek agreement to write to the Permanent Secretary to again outline our dissatisfaction with the continuing lack of time, uh, timelines, uh, timeliness and provision of papers, and reiterate, reiterate our concern that as a committee, we are unable to fulfill our scrutiny role without the full cooperation of the department. Okay. Um, okay, uh, item six in the agenda, we have uh, oral evidence from the RSPB. Um, it's relation to the statutory rules regulation on inspection rates. 
I want to refer to correspondence from the RSPB at page uh, 34 of your packs. And I want to welcome by Starleaf, Philip Carson, the um, Land Use Policy Officer, and Dr. Jonathan Bell, Head of Land and Sea Policy. Uh, Jonathan and Philip, you are very welcome. Uh, can um, they be brought in? Can we brought on live? Hello, Chair. Thank you. Hello, Philip. Um, can you hear us okay? Yes, we can. Uh, you, you're very welcome here this morning, and uh, it's great to see you. Uh, even though we have to do it all virtual now, it's, it's great to see you. So uh, thank you. Uh, do you want to uh, commence your, your beating there, Jonathan and Philip? No problem, Chair. Thank you very much, and thank you for, for having us to speak to you on, on such short notice. Um, we we have written to you in relation to the SRs that will be debated in the Assembly on the 22nd of February um, in relation to agricultural support payments, and they are direct payments to farmers' amendment regulations and the direct farmer or payments to farmers' simplification regulations. Um, these regulations will make several changes to basic payment regulations with the purpose of simplifying how the scheme operates and is administered in Northern Ireland. Um, although the SRs make mainly technical changes to existing regulations, we had some initial concerns with some of the changes being proposed, particularly around Part 7, um, which states that it will set minimum inspection rates for area-related schemes to 1%, um, which is a reduction from 3%. On our reading, it wasn't initially clear whether the proposed changes apply to land eligibility inspections or all cross-compliance inspections. However, we have had some clarification from the department um, that has alleviated some of our concerns that the reduction applied to cross-compliance inspections. Um, they will only apply to land eligibility inspections, which has alleviated those initial concerns. Um, we understand that simplifications will be taking place for the 2021 scheme year, but in our opinion, moving forward, we need a clear, explicit purpose for future agricultural funding um, to ensure that simplification contributes towards the delivery of wider strategic objectives and outcomes from farming and land use, um, the principles of which have been outlined by the Minister as increased productivity, environmental sustainability, resilience and supply chain functionality. We believe these changes should form part of a clear, predefined transition to new systems of farm support, and that primary agricultural legislation would play an important part in providing this transition period, ensuring certainty for farmers, whilst also helping to ensure that urgent action is delivered to help meet environmental priorities. As yet, it's unclear when primary legislation will be brought forward um, to provide this legal framework or an associated timeline in terms of a transition, and we believe this should be prioritised. Um, we acknowledge that DARE will be undertaking um, a full review of cross-compliance in terms of the regulatory side of things, um, improving how it operates in Northern Ireland. And from our perspective, we welcome this. Um, and it's important that a future agricultural policy framework is underpinned by a more ambitious, effective regulatory baseline, um, which could include enhanced ambition on biodiversity, a more proactive approach to protection of soils, and will also help to mitigation targets as well um, and improving that regulatory baseline. And we, work for, we look forward to working with the department in this. Yeah. Um, th thank you. Jonathan, you want to add to that or are you content with Philip's comments? You're on mute, John. Yeah, mute, yeah. no content with, with Philip's uh, comments. I mean, our initial concerns were really in relation to, to part seven. Of the regulations around the minimum inspection rates um, and whether that applied to cross compliance or not and um, but we think we've had that cleared up this morning that it doesn't but phil then points to a couple of really important issues around future direction of travel yeah um so so to, just to, to seek clarification from our point of view um you since your representation to us you have subsequently met the department and sought clarification uh, that this uh, proposed reduction in inspections for this year uh, won't have a negative impact on the issue of cross-compliance? 
Yeah, that's correct. So the proposed reduction is only going to apply to land eligibility. We had initial concerns that it would apply to cross compliance rules in totality. That has, um, I suppose, our concerns have been addressed there, and we're content with them. And our initial our initial concerns have have um, been allowed, I suppose. Well, well, well that's that's perfect. Um, and again, thanks for making that representation to the committee because that's what that's what we're here for. You know, to receive such representation. So, thank you for that representation, and I'm glad that the issues that you have highlighted, um, you know, have certainly ha have have been cleared up for you. So, thanks very much for coming on here this morning, and, and no doubt we'll be in contact with you uh, as future schemes and future policies rolls out rolls out in the next in the time ahead. So, thank you, Philip and Jonathan. Two minutes, Clarence. Thank you, Chair. All right, I hear Stella in the background there. Yes, Stella. Clarence asked a question. Wants to ask a question. Oh, sorry, Claire. Sorry. Claire. No bother. Sorry, I didn't realise it was going to be so quick. <laughs> Thanks. Listen, and just on the issue that you're saying that um, you're looking at the future direction or raising concerns or potential concerns about the future direction, um, uh, do you have any particular issues i mean do you, is, is there any specific examples for example of current government policy that you feel needs to be addressed that have led to current poor states of nature yes from, from our perspective um and, and in relation to to this point we want to see a reform of the the policy in its totality and whilst we recognize that simplification um will help improve, I suppose, the delivery of the schemes in the short term. We need to see them change altogether. And one of the points we're making is having that predefined transition period so that simplification of our current system isn't seen as an end in itself and that it's moving towards a wider change. Um, we would like to see, I suppose, a legal basis to provide public money for public goods, which would provide a duty on new schemes to be adopted to replace what we have at the moment. If we don't have those, there's a risk potentially of drift um, where we wouldn't have that reform and we would just have the simplified scheme going on longer than, than is necessary. So for us, it's that, that predefined transition period and ensuring that simplification is, is contributing towards a wider change later on down the line. And we need that clarity um, and that certainty for, for farmers to plan and prepare their businesses and get ready for that change. So that simplification is helping that. Um, and also knowing that, that this a future system of farm support will address issues in terms of water quality, decline in nature, things. And um, we believe that I suppose financial assistance purposes in a new piece of legislation should be based on public money for public goods um, rather than, than what we have at the moment. And just on that, the public money for public goods is obviously within the um, Westminster legislation that will be applied to England, really. Do you feel that there's been any impact for having um, no or overarching agri-bill for Northern Ireland specifically? And do you feel that there's any impact that that has had on the agri-legislation that has been reduced? have been produced sorry, since December. Sorry, could you repeat that again? I'm thinking of the public money for public goods and that whole concept being into in the agri bill that will apply for England. Do you feel that there's what has there been any impact for Northern Ireland having no specific agri, agri bill? Um and whether sorry I'll just leave it there. I think I'm bouncing as well with the sound. No, 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 no worries. Yeah, I suppose the big the big thing is that in other part in other parts of the UK and in Europe there is a, there is going to be reform. So you've mentioned England, which is moving towards public money for public goods, where funding will be delivered through an environmental land management scheme. In Wales, they're currently consulting on a white paper for their own agriculture bill, which will do something similar, where they have, will have a sustainable land management scheme, and that will focus on delivering those environmental priorities, as well as improving productivity and things too. Um, Scotland have committed to agriculture legislation by 2024, and in the EU, the, the cap is going through a period of reform. So I suppose the, the risk is that without a Northern Ireland piece of legislation, that change mightn't happen as quickly, um, and we could 
hopefully uh, without that legal basis, the, the reform mightn't be as in keeping pace with other parts of, of the UK and Europe. So at the moment, in terms of provisions of the UK Agriculture Bill and how it applies to Northern Ireland, there isn't really any specific um, impetus for change. That's for, for Northern Ireland government to, to deliver. Okay, thank okay. you. Um, John? John Blair? John, can John, can you hear John? That's me. I didn't have a microphone. Uh, I called. Uh, if it's okay with you, I want to, to thank Bill and Johnny for what they brought to us there. Um, if I could just broaden this out slightly and, and try to relate what, what I'm talking about to, to the legislation and forthcoming legislation. Um, as I understand it, there, there's a Blue Planet Fund being um, introduced by the UK government. Uh, with a sum total available of somewhere around 500 million. I asked a question in the chamber on this one day, couldn't get information, and I accept that I was asking a minister who had only been in books for a day or two. Um, separate to that, I also understand there's a Nature for Climate Fund being developed for England. And I'm wondering you know, what impact and what assistance would that provide for us if we were to develop similar here so as we could roll those out in tandem with any legislative or regulatory change? I think um, on that, John, yeah, the nature for climate funds is very, very relevant in the current context. I think it's 640 million the UK government is committed to, and that's going to, to rule out things like um, wide-scale or large-scale peatland restoration, appropriate native tree planting. Uh, and I think a similar uh, fund would be very relevant uh, and important in Northern Ireland. You know, only about 14% of our uh, peatland habitat here is deemed to be in, intact. 86% is not intact, uh, so we need to undertake large-scale peatland restoration. But it's not just happening in England. Scotland have committed $250 million over the next 10 years to peatland restoration. Uh, Wales have launched their um, peatland restoration program as well, uh, committing, I think, around about a million pounds a year over each of the next five years. And in the south, there's been $108 million dedicated to uh, restoring former peat extraction sites. So in that context, I think there's real scope uh, for Northern Ireland to develop a, a Nature for Climate Fund or something similar. And this would really tie into the whole green recovery agenda. Um, and potentially then we need to look at how we reward landowners for maintaining, protecting and managing those important sites once they're restored. Okay, that's helpful. And I assume... Um... The, these schemes that are being developed obviously involve the, the landowners, but there would be scope there to involve others in the environmental sector to get involved and advise uh, as well. Absolutely. We need to be a collaborative approach and we need to work in partnership. And when it comes to, say, peatland restoration or tree planting, there's great examples out there of the NGO sector working hand in hand with landowners to deliver that. Um, so partnership working and collaboration will, will be key to yeah. that. Yep. Okay, look, th th thanks for that. Thanks, John. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so, Jonathan, Philip, uh, thank you very much for uh, attending here this morning. And uh, we will, uh, as I said previously, we'll be in discussion with you in the time ahead. So, thank you. Thank you. Right, thank you. Uh, have a nice day. Thank you. Um, okay, members, um, item seven um, on your agenda is a uh, a written briefing uh, on the draft uh, SR, the Direct Payment to Farmers and Amendment Regulations NA 2021, and the Department Written Briefing SR, the Direct Payment to Farmers Simplification Regulations NA 2021. I want to refer members to the memo from Stella uh, uh, at the Hansard from the meeting on the 4th of February, and papers from the Department in the main pack from page 37 onwards. Well, ladies and members, the committee first considered this policy of the two regulations at the SL1 stage on the 4th of February, uh, which members indicate they uh, should both move to the next legislative stage. Both regulations are subject to the draft affirmative resolution procedure. The debate of these two SRs will take place in the chamber next week, Monday, and I will represent the views of the committee at that debate. The examiner set of rules has not raised any issues with either of the regulations. And do members have any uh, comments in relation to this um, SR? No. Um, any questions? Okay. So, um, okay. So, if members are content, I'll put the question on each SR separately. The Committee for Agriculture, Environment, and Rural Affairs has considered draft SR, the Direct Payment to Farmers Amendment, 
Regulations NA 2021 and have no objections to the rule. And the Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs has considered SR 2021 the direct payment to farmers simplification regulations NA 2021 and has no objections to the rule. Okay. Okay, members, um, I'm going to move on now to item 8 on our agenda. It's the uh, uh, um, a written briefing on the Zionis and Diseases, Animals and Amendment Order 2021, uh, pages 97 to 104 on your packs. I want to advise members that the SR will be laid in the Assembly under the negative resolution procedure and will come into operation as soon as possible. The Department advises that there have been no reports of SARS. COV-2, a virus in livestock or birds, or birds, but it has, however, been reported in a considerable number of mink farms in several countries around the world. Although there are three mink farms operating in the south of Ireland, including one in Donegal, there are no mink farms uh, here or in Britain. This is because fur farming was banned across the UK in 2002. Nevertheless, there is a concern about the possibility of infection in the closely related populations of ferrets and, and possibility that similar mutations that have been evidenced in mink could occur in ferrets. The department intends to make legislation to ensure that it is notified when SARS-CoV-2 is detected in animals here. It is unlikely, in the unlikely event is that it is necessary to protect public health, it will have to, it will have the power to cull any affected animals and compensate their owners. This would uh, ensure consistency with the position in other jurisdictions where legislative changes are also being made. Can I seek comment from uh, um, any uh, um, any members got any comments that they want to make in relation to that there? <coughs> okay. Um, you know, just from a personal point of view, I think it's important for both animal and human health. This one here, and I, I think it's uh, I think it's personal would welcome that there. Okay. So, uh, are we content with the merits of the policy and we move to the next legislative stage? Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, item nine members on our agenda is com committee consideration of the lags responses on the future rural development policy. Uh, I want to refer members to the memo from the clerk at page 105 and summary of the responses at 107. A member will recall that the committee agreed to request written evidence from the local action groups following the department briefing in November on the future rural policy and uh, uh, framework delivery. Um, I just want to take the opportunity to thank the lags for taking the time to uh, send in these responses. That, that was very, very welcome. And yeah. I, want, I was listening in this morning. I want to thank you for that because it's important that we get that type of information to inform our, um, our response to the uh, future rural policy when it does come out for consultation and agreement. Um, are members content that we place the written responses from the local action groups on the committee's webpage and write to the department seeking an update on the issues highlighted in the tax memo? Okay. Thank you. Um, item number 10, a written briefing proposal to introduce a crop. Oh, sorry, I have Harry Harvey is looking to ask a question. Harry was moving on. A bit swift there. Is it relation to the lags or is it, or is it another topic? In relation to the lags, Chair, it was just a very simple question. Uh, have we heard back from all the lags or just uh, some of them? That was all, Chair. I think there's the full 11 in. Because um, I took a, let me see here, I will scan through the, the, the overall majority of them here. Yeah. We okay. have. Uh, we have Arden North Down, we have Grove from South Antrim, Mid and East Antrim, Fermanagh and Oma, Lagan Rural Partnership, Mid Ulster, and uh, Sower, which is uh, Antrim, Banbridge, and Craig Avon. Um, that's the majority of them, isn't it? Yeah, I, just, I didn't see Newry more than Down there, not. that's the only reason I was asked, and I wondered if I've not heard back from them, but that's okay, Chair, it's no problem. It's just uh, maybe they haven't replied as yet. Yeah, well, yeah, the, the, perhaps their response is pending, but uh, but that's 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 a, a, a review of the ones have sent them questions. Okay, no thank you very much. Sorry, no problem. Thank you, Harry, for that. Um, okay, the uh, nature. 
Sorry, who? Uh, and me, very briefly, if that's okay. Um, uh, I was going to suggest, although I'm mindful that it's already in the replies for, from some of the lags, but if we could, in, in any covering letter, refer specifically to the uncertainty at the current time with COVID and the impact of that, as well as the uncertainty over fu future funding and future governance yeah. surrounding issues. Yeah, I, I agree with you, John. And uh, I think that, uh, in relation to that there, and also in relation to Harry's comments, no, we, we can chase up them other lags who perhaps haven't had the response in yet. You know, and I think we, we need to look at we need to look at as well because the local action groups are a, a pool a huge pool of um, expertise and resources, and they've been de delivering that leader approach. And they the lags themselves needs a bit of certainty about what's yeah. going to happen. You exactly. know, uh, I think there's a, there's there's a, there's a lot of uh, issues in there because they do provide that grassroots. So yeah. many um, of us, uh, I suppose, sure, sure, the, the point I'm making really is that you know. What whatever uncertainty exists for the lags and, uh, and groups and and um, partner agencies, there's the added pressure of, of the COVID period and the impact of that, which could be quite quite um, you know a long long time ahead, still impacting on the work that's being done. Yeah, absolutely, John. So thank you, uh, and we will chase all of that up. And um, and again, once again, thanks to the the local action groups who took time out to respond very comprehensively, I have to say. Um, item number 10 is a written briefing from the department on the proposal to introduce a protein crop, uh, protein crop payment pilot scheme for 2021. The written briefing from the department is at page 138. I want to advise members that the department has advised that recent period of consultation on the proposal to introduce a protein crop payment pilot scheme for 2021. There's 22 responses received. Majority were in support of a couple of support for protein crops being introduced. The Minister has now asked officials to introduce a protein crop pilot scheme uh, for 2021. And um, uh, uh, for, for, asked officials to introduce a protein crop payment scheme for 2021 and 2022 as a pilot. Legislation that introduced the scheme was presented to the committee on the 4th of February. Secondary legislation is being introduced uh, under the powers of the uh, UK Agricultural Act 2020, the Direct Payment to Farmers Simplification Regulations MA 2021, which is subject to draft affirmative process and be scheduled for assembly debate on the 22nd of February. Are members, um, are members any comments or are they content to note this written briefing? Just to say, Mr. Chairman, it's very welcome. I think it is, uh, will help and will encourage protein crops to grow. Thank you for that, William. That's noted. Um, Chair, I have a hand up there if you can hear me, if that's all right. Yep. Or sent you a wee cue. Just a comment as well that um, I'm delighted with it. And um, 18 positive responses out of the 22 back is all good. And that only certified and tested seeds would be used. It's, um, it's all good news. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for that comment, Harry. Um, item number 11, a written briefing, Dara, on the 30 year strategy. It's at page 147. The strategy was first considered by the committee on the 17th of December. At what stage, the committee requested an oral briefing to take account of a number of queries that members raised. However, due to the revised guidance issued by the Assembly Commission on, uh, on considering written briefings rather than oral briefings due to COVID, the committee agreed to seek a further written update to incorporate queries that members had. The department has now responded uh, with an updated briefing, and I will give members a few moments to read over the uh, over to we look at, and if you have any comments, uh, department officials are keen to um, finalise the plan so that it can be communicated to staff and stakeholders, and work can focus on the first of the five-year plans, which will support the achievement of the key priorities as set out in Dara's plan to 2050. Um, do you want to take a couple of seconds to? Um, read over it, um, you, well, you, you obviously will have had the chance to look, look over it when the pack was issued, but if there's have an RV look out there. Okay, are, are, are members happy to support the Deer of the 30 Year Strategy? Okay. Chair. Yeah. Who, who's looking in there, Philip? 
Yes, I, go. I, I just wonder, I mean, is it, do we have to agree it today or is there further questions that we can maybe submit uh, just for further clarification on it? Uh, Stella, can you advise us on the timeline of this? I do think the other officials are trying to get this published as soon as possible, but you could certainly ask for further questions and allow them to move ahead and publish. If there's anything further you want to ask, just send them in to me. Okay, fair enough. That'll do. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Stella. Um, okay. Um, members, uh, item 12 on the agenda uh, is uh, correspondence. It's page 176. And um, up, okay, I'll try and just get to 176 myself. Uh, the, so I want to draw members to the following: the correspondence from the uh, correspondence from the Middle East Antrim Borough Council at page two eighty four, advising that is un, 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 unable to provide a date to brief the committee on shared environmental services. They provided a written briefing in lieu of the presentation. The clerk has now been in contact by telephone and email with the director of development, and a number of dates have now been offered. No response has yet been received. The 25th report from external sector rules, which has been tabled and covers the two SRs uh, we considered earlier. Okay, so if members have any uh, uh, comments in relation to any of that there. Mr. Chairman, what are the dates again? Uh, have they given us Sorry, the they provide no correspondence. I mean, I provide, uh, there's no, there's no, there's no specific dates as yet, do they, Stella? A number of dates have been offered. Stella, what dates have been offered? Um, the dates that have been offered are the ones immediately after Easter recess. Three dates, the, the first three dates after Easter recess, the 15th, 22nd, and the 29th of April. Uh, Could I ask the base? Yeah, uh, go ahead. Um, um, yeah. I'm just, I mean, this has been going on for a while. I know that um, we've been asking a, a while to be coming and they keep um, responding to say that they can't come. But I'm just want to ask is this normal? I mean, is any other sort of statutory body found it so hard to attend committee before? Can, can I ask, have they given any reasons for not not attending or, or it appears to not want me to attend? Yeah. Stella, is there any, any, any detail at all? Or? Um, if the members who are unmuted, William, Claire and Rosemary could just mute just to deal with the echo sound. They, they as yet have provided no um, reason for their... Not, not being able to attend on the date that we requested. And um, it would be very, very unusual for uh, a public body to refuse to come to a committee. Okay. So um, we just more or less have to await then the response to our latest uh, communications to them, Stella. Would that be fair to say? Yes, I, I have chased them up again this morning, so they are trying to get back to me with a confirmed date as soon as possible. I'm saying, and it's important that we, we do know or do let them know that the, the, the committee is disappointed, disappointed that they're not able to avail themselves to us. You know, as yet, you know, I think it's important that they realize that uh, I think they're trying to hide. Chair, Chair, if I could come in just briefly. Yeah, uh, go William and Rosemary, uh, but well, we do need to express their disappointment, and maybe we should point out to them as well. Um, it doesn't have to be the individual or the individual's plural named on the letter. I would assume that um, a service of that size should have a range of people who should be available to come and brief the committee if required, and, and perhaps they should look across their available resource um, if, if they've had an issue trying to tie it down to one person. Okay. 
I will ensure those views are conveyed to SES this afternoon. Okay. So if you're looking in the SES, okay. okay. Um, right, uh, members, one other thing that um, I just want to mention, it's just as relation to the our invitation to the minister to come and meet the committee. He has uh, he's declined to come to meet the committee, um, given that he said that his expected his ministerial term to be short. Um, like I, I note and welcome that the minister has been meeting stakeholder organisations. I'm, I'm reading in the paper about constructive meetings with stakeholder organisations where he discussed his priorities and also the fact that uh, he was going to be making decisions whilst in charge, albeit interim. So I find it almost, almost undermining of our committee that uh, he sees fit to meet stakeholder organisations to discuss his ministerial priorities, yet hasn't got the time to meet the committee. So that would be my personal view on this uh, declining to meet us. I, I totally agree, uh, Chair, uh, and I, I, I think we should uh, write back making that point known to the Minister. Uh, I mean, the, the committee has an important role uh, assisting and scrutinising the work of the Minister, and I don't think it's acceptable, regardless of whatever length of time he, he may or may not be in the role. The fact is, he is in the role. He is the minister, and this is the statutory committee charged with scrutinising. If he's meeting with other groups uh, to discuss his priorities, then I think that, that he certainly should be meeting this uh, committee. And I, I would suggest that we write back to him, making those views known. Uh, William? Yeah, yeah, Mr. Chairman, I, I surmise by the time he would get a date set, he, he will not be in the job, I would have thought, because I, I, as I'm aware, uh, the former minister preached is one to take up that role as soon as possible again. So I, I would have thought by the time he, he did get a date, he will no longer be in the role. That would be my view. Well, I'm, I'm prepared to, I would be prepared to accept that. But whenever you read the farm and press, and he's been having these meetings with other stakeholder organisations to discuss his ministerial priorities, I, I find it astonishing that the time can't be created to uh, meet us to discuss the priorities. Claire? Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, I agree as well. I, mean, um, I did ask the, the Minister from the floor in the chamber um, that we would be looking forward to meeting him at committee, and he said that he would be happy to attend if he was invited. Um, so that's a bit of a U-turn as well. But I think regardless of whether it's Minister Lyons or whether it's Minister Poots coming back, we haven't had very much engagement with the Minister directly at committee anyway. So I, I just think that, you know, we should be doing and we should be seeing and hearing and meeting more with the Minister directly, um, regardless of whether Minister Lyons is in post for any length of time or not. Um, you know, when was the last time the committee actually met with the Minister? Uh, uh, Patsy has indicated he was coming there in the mud shop facility. Oh, oh, yes, yeah, thanks very much, Chair. Um, surely the department, the private office, can give a date, and it doesn't really matter whichever minister's in. Uh, I do hope that, that Edwin's back and well and fit to do his job. So, a date by the department to give us that. Now, if that date proves to be way, way, way in advance, way down the lane, two or three months down the lane, that'll be completely unsatisfactory. But whether it's Gordon Lyons or Edwin, and I hope that it is, Edward, that um, they're fit to give us a date at least. It's the same private office, the same diary. Okay. Okay. Um, remember, okay, we just sort of respond to that there. Remember, okay? Chair, we're getting a bit paranoid that the Minister doesn't want to meet us, neither do Shared Environmental Services and Mid-East London Council want to meet us. Like, there's something we can only spell them, not want to meet us. <laughs> I think there's a pattern. Well, uh, it's unfair to say the minister, like Minister Pierce has met us on a number of occasions, and I mean it's quite easy to look there when the last time he met us. It's not that long ago, and even when he wasn't well and only out of an operation, he actually met us a, a week later. So I think it's very unfair and disingenuous to say the minister is not meeting the com committee because he certainly is. Okay, right. Okay, no, we've noted that as well, William. So. Okay, members. Um, are members okay to action correspondence to suggest an index sheet um, for the rest of the correspondence? Okay. Okay, members, I'm 13. Um, 
I want to uh, refer members to the draft for work programme to you at page 307. I want to advise members of the following. Members will recall that it was agreed that the clerk would liaise with the House of Commons BEIS committee regarding its work on the COP26 conference plan for November. As members are aware, COP26 is an international climate change conference. The BEIS committee is inviting the relevant devolved legislature committees and appropriate committees from the House of Commons and Lords to a roundtable meeting on COP26. The meeting will focus on best practice and climate change scrutiny and is likely to be held before the Easter recess. Further details will be forthcoming in due course. Are members interested in attending this roundtable? Yep, yeah, a good few nods across the, the, the floor here. Uh, additionally, the, the, that committee is considering holding an event as part of the COP26 activities um, and international parliamentary climate change scrutiny. Such an event will be held in November. If this happened, would the committee be interested in attending? Yeah. Yes. A good few nods across the, the board. So we all advise the member that the joint com uh, committee, the joint meeting with infrastructure and economy committees with the HMRC TSS will likely be on the 24th of March and members will receive further details in due course. Okay, members, uh, item 14 on your agenda is um, any other business? Is there any, any other business that want to raise? Yeah. Yes, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Yeah, well, William? Yes, William? Yeah, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm sure some of the of us are aware and I heard a representative from the Woodland Trust on the radio this morning. Hundreds of thousands of trees that were ordered for Northern Ireland have to be cancelled because because of the protocol they can no longer come to Northern Ireland. This is a major issue. We are all pleased when we were told that there's going to be more tree planting in Northern Ireland and there's a big scheme and the minister had uh, signed off on that. Uh, we now find ourselves that we can't get these trees from the UK. Within the within the one United Kingdom, we can't get trees from one part of it to the other to plant. So I think the committee needs we need to we need to sit up and do something or be seen to ask questions. I think it's absolutely ridiculous that due to the protocol we're in this situation. I think it's scandalous. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm very much content that we. Yeah, can I can I just. Yeah, can I just can I just add to that? Yes, we've been looking at greening issues. We're looking at a way forward with climate change, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And as we know, trees play an important part. The planting of trees, etc. And I think I would agree with Willie there that we need to need to be looking at uh, looking at some other way in relation to these investigating this tree. Can I just add my support there as well, please? And I think what's further scandalous is the fact that, you know, this island, um, north and south, has reached such a, a stage of deforestation um, right across the island. Um, and that has to be recorded as well. Yes, we, we have this. Uh, I think it was 18 million trees that the minister wanted to plant, you know, and we can't get them from the south either because they've no trees or with the black, they've a, you know, they need to be planted more too. But it's. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, this is an absolute scandalous situation. I mean, the committee needs to be proactive in this situation and uh, right to DEFRA. You know, I'm, I'm not sure what way we go on this. I mean, our own minister has been. A fight in the corner on this too, but I mean it, it is absolutely ridiculous that trees, hundreds of thousands of trees that have been ordered. Woodland Trust representative was on the radio this morning saying that they had to cancel these trees because they can't get them because of the protocol. Well, I heard that this morning on the way up the road to William. And would the committee agree that we, we perhaps write to Minister's Gove and you just to highlight that concern? Chair, I have no difficulty with that at all, but um, uh, I'd like to ask some of the questions and I think a priority question yesterday on this very topic um, to find out what um, the Northern Ireland Minister um, is discussing either with DEFRA, HRC or others in, relationship, in relation to their um, conversations with the EU. So could we, if we're writing to those ministers, um, also copy our own minister and try to find out what's happening from DERA in relation to being included in those conversations to find solutions to the problem. 
Yeah, members agree? Great. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Members, okay. Um, Can I also add that, you know, we've got, we've got grants. We've got grants in place at the moment in relation to some farmers are using trees, saplings, etc. You know, what's what's their future? They've applied for grants. These, these platforms are not available. So we have a problem there within our agricultural community too. I, I, that's, you're talking about like the knock-on for like the woodland expansion scheme, Rosemary? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh, yeah. Yeah, so we are content to uh, action those things right to the, the, the relevant ministers across the water and indeed to uh, our own here uh, to find out what the engagement can on with the EU and others around these yeah. issues. And I think we should make, Mr. Chairman, we should make it clear of our concern in this issue. You know, it, it is clear concern for this body. Yeah, well, I, I, I think that. Um, you know, I think the committee will agree there is a concern we get about that there, and that's something we want to see uh, resolved. So, um, Chair. So Sure. Can, I can, um, can we equally stress that it's, it's you know a matter uh, you know that we're equally distressed that the, the amount of trees that we have removed as well that we've brought ourselves to this point uh, and, and that should not be done ever again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Okay, member so um, thank you very much. I've I've gone here. I do have a wish to bring uh, Eklund through the chair. I've got another item I wish to sort of bring up. Yeah, go ahead, Rosemary. Yeah. I have been getting... Okay, thank you. I've been getting sort of emails about RHI, et cetera, et cetera. And I know RHI is not within the remit of DERA. It is within the remit of the economy. And I'm wondering if the economy com committee could keep us updated on their decisions in relation to RHI. Yeah, so we, we, we would um, make representation to the college committee that kept in the loop of what they're doing. Rosemary, yeah. that's a proposal. Members okay with that? Yes. Yeah. 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 That, that, that's quite important because there's many, a large number of farmers that have yielded the scheme, so really uh, they have been impacted badly by this all. So I think it's important that we should get uh, a response from the proper uh, department, yeah. The department and the committee, is that right? Department and the committee, both? Yeah, that's okay. All right, your suggestion, department. Um, right, thank you. Okay, then, members. Um, so, the last item here now is the date and time of the next meeting. We're meeting next Thursday, 25th of February. The month will soon be gone at 10 a.m. And again, a, a virtual meeting streamed on the Assembly website. So thank you very much for attending the weekly meeting and um, I'm going to join you here now. I'll probably see you across the floor at the start of the week, okay? Take care now. Bye-bye. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.